about the Transformers. I'll tell you what. So, uh, Brother Vernon was telling me when he was up there in, in um, uh, El Dorado with us that y'all sing mu- music off the wall. And and I come here this morning, I was looking everywhere. Where, where do they sing music off the wall? There's no place to do it. And then all of a sudden when I come back in here, because I wasn't in here when the thing came down. All right, there we go. I wasn't in here and the thing came down and then that thing went up in the ceiling. I said, I'm telling everybody. <laughs> they, they, got, they got a screen that goes up in the ceiling. Uh, book of Jonah. I'm going to have you turn to the book of Jonah. And I want to bring you greetings from the flatlands of El Dorado. Uh, it's nothing like it is here in El Dorado. It's flat as a pancake. You can see for miles and then uh, there's all kinds of corn and beans and farming is king. Uh, Farmer Brown's got implements all over the middle of the road all the time. And uh, there's always something going on, lots of, lots of farming, lots of all kinds of uh, uh, food raised up there. And, uh, and uh, good folks, and I'm telling you, they're good folks that do anything in the world for you. And that's what makes it such a hard area uh, to be in because the folks are genuinely just good people. And so when you start preaching about sin, they well, I don't sin. I'm a good guy. I was down there yesterday helping so-and-so build his barn. You know, I'm over here tomorrow. We're going to, uh, you know, help what's his name is his barn burned down and we're going to bring all his hogs over. I mean, you know, they're just good folks. And so telling them that, that, you know, you have to be understand what sin is and that you're a sinner before you can be saved. And so it just uh, uh, they're, they're good folks, but they're not like it is here. Um, you know, they they don't like to be touched <laughs> and we're huggers uh, when everybody got ready to leave. Um, I said, I, I don't know, I, you know, I know it's off-putting to a lot of people, but we're huggers, and everybody come around and hugged us, you know. But we actually get comments from folks telling us, uh, why are they hugging? <laughs> yeah, makes them a little uncomfortable, you know. Uh, it's just not something that's normal around there. Now, they have hospital; they'll feed you good. Uh, but, uh, you know, I'm the type of person to show up at your house, I kick my shoes off and dig through the refrigerator. Uh, and, and that's just not the way they are. You know, it's like, I didn't give you that, and you can't have it. <laughs> you know, so, so you have to kind of, you know, it's just a little different. It's got, it's got a lot of German ancestry, and uh, uh, we have ran into some folks that were somewhat hostile. They said uh, uh, the area where we're at has a Unitarian presence. It's been there for 100 years. And uh, they'll tell you, we're liberals, and we're open-minded, and we're tolerant, and we don't want no Baptist. <laughs> So, I said, so you open-minded to everybody but Baptist. That's right. So at least they're honest about it. So, but uh, anyway, the, the, one of the neat things is, and I'll tell you more about the church as it got going on as we get into the message, you know. Uh, but one of the neat things is how God is always preparing, and that's why I got the book of Jonah here today, how God is always preparing things. Now, I just cannot tell you enough what it meant to us for you folks to come down there. The words just don't exist for you folks to come up and help us out as you did and give us a big boost. I'd probably still be working on that bathroom. <laughs> so it, it's been a, a big help for fo- the folks to come and, and give us a hand like that. And we are actually getting to where we're painting things and uh, getting ready to run uh, stuff in the ceiling and things like that. So uh, I'm, I'm working towards uh, being able to have Thanksgiving in our new fellowship hall. So. I want to uh, just the smell of turkey in the auditorium just 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 delights my heart. <laughs> so anyway, are you in the book of Jonah? If you're there, say amen. Uh, that it's it's on page sixteen ninety four. So. Uh, <laughs> we're going to start reading in verse three. The word of God says, "I'm not sorry. I said verse three. I mean chapter three. And the Bible says, "And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise." Go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey. And he cried, said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast. And put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. For word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him, and covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh 
by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth, and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. It is my habit after I read the verses to pray, but I don't know who to call on. So, Brother Benny, would you call somebody to pray for us? Now, our God has preserved in his word this story of the book of Jonah. And I don't know what it's like here, but up where I live, this is... I, I've been saved, I don't know, since 1987 or something like that. And I've been in church most of that time. Uh, well, I've been in church the whole time and, and uh, very seldom ever miss a Sunday. And I could probably say I maybe, maybe one time heard this Bible, this book preached out of. This book's not very popular because uh, it's, it's, people are very skeptical about it. They say, you don't really believe Jonah was swallowed by a whale, do you? You know, these are folks that believe that, uh, well, that, that nothing exploded and everything came into existence. You know, and then uh, DNA just pops out of rocks. And, and, and critters just decide just to swim through the ocean. You know, I'm tired of swimming through the ocean. I'm going to just crawl out on dry land and become a, a, a mammal. You know, and they're telling me I believe in fairy tales? I mean, seriously, you know, nothing exploded and everything come into existence it doesn't make any sense. But they, this is, people are very skeptical about this scripture. But for the Christian, it's settled. Because Jesus Christ himself taught it as real. And he taught it as real and he said, This wicked and perverse generation seeks for a sign, but none of them's going to be given it except the sign of Jonah. They said, as Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights, so must the Son of Man be in the belly of the earth for three days and three nights. And so it was a sign, and, and the whole thing, the whole book of Jonah is a symbol and a sign of what it is to be missionary-minded and a mission work and how God was going to spread the gospel through the world. And what he had was he had a messenger. He had a messenger and he said, go down there and preach to them Ninevites. God calls and gives visions to people today. Just like he did back then. And he set it out whenever he set up his church. You know, I want you to go over to those folks. I want you to go to the people here in Corbin. I want you to go to the people in El Dorado. When we started in El Dorado, we was actually told by the association, we want you to go somewhere else. There's not enough people here. It's going to be too hard. We've had two Baptist churches start off in that church and fail. But God gives a vision. Maybe this morning God's given one of you a vision. I've already talked to a lady today saying, you know, God's been laying on my heart that that's something I need to be involved in. Maybe God's trying to show you a vision right now. Now I'm telling you, God always uses visions to tell His people what He wants them to do. He, he uses it through His Word. He lays it upon your heart. He gives you an idea. This church didn't just appear out of nothing. It didn't come from an explosion in a brick factory. God laid it on somebody's heart. There can be a church right here. And then he got all, not only laid it on their heart, but other people who came along beside and he made provision for it. Did you see what happened with Jonah? When, if you go back and read the book of Jonah, you find that God had prepared a great fish for Jonah. He'd been doing it for a long time. Maybe this fish was prepared from its day of birth. Maybe it's a whole species of fish that we just haven't seen. I love the way scientists tell us, oh, that's a mythological creature. How do you know? Well, we ain't never seen them. That, you know, I don't know about you, but our ancestors hunt the fire out of everything that'll eat us. You know, where I live, there's no timber rattlers because all my ancestors killed them. <laughs> you, know, they, you know, the women told the men, those things have got to go. <laughs> so the men went out there with sticks and killed them all. You know, and there's people running around trying to release those things in the wild. <laughs> What are you doing? We just got rid of them. You know, there's no wolves where we live. You know, and I don't know if you have wolves down here, but we don't have no wolves. 
And there's people running around wanting to put wolves out there. You environmentalists must not live in the environment. <laughs> These things eat people. You know, so our ancestors got rid of them. Whatever this fish is, I guarantee you, if it's running around eating people, that a bunch of people built boats, went out and tried to kill the thing. You know, it may be something that's extinct now. Just because we haven't seen it don't mean it never existed. God prepared this fish. And it, maybe it had a birth defect, an extra bladder or something that kept the air in there for a Jonah. Whatever it was, God was already working, was probably working 50, 60 years in the past. Because he said, I know Jonah's going to need to have me convincing and I'm going to make his fish. Because God does this all the time. I've seen him do it in my own life. Make provision for me and I'm going, what in the world is God doing? We started off in El Dorado with three families. We had, we had uh, two families and me and my wife. The two families had a falling out over their kids. You know how that goes. <laughs> so they both get mad and they quit. We're done. Me and Tess looking at each other and we got four kids. There's six of us. <laughs> you know, the building, we, the, the building that we're in, that guy who owned that building at the time says, you come out there, you start a Baptist church, and, 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 and we'll, we'll just get this thing going on. He goes, I'm a Baptist, and, and, every, and the guy didn't even own the building. <laughs> he just told us this stuff. So that door closed right there. We didn't have a building. The families left. We were meeting in the library, and the library said, we're changing our hours, and it made it to where we couldn't even have a, a meeting in the library. So another door, bam, closed. This is somewhere around 20... 10. I'm looking at my wife and I think, well, you know, maybe I just had some bad beans or something. I, I, you know, may, maybe something's going on here. Maybe I misread what the Lord wanted me to do. So I said, you know, I hate to not just have a Sunday morning service. So what we'll do is we'll have a Sunday morning service and see what happens. And so we prepped and we went out and, and, and told everybody what was going on, handed out flyers and so on and so forth to see what was happening and, and uh, see if anybody would show up. And I told my wife, if no one from El Dorado comes, I think we messed up. I think I messed up. I think I misheard what the Lord wanted me to do. I think I might have wasted everybody's time. Two people from El Dorado showed up. And just like when Abraham was talking to God, and Abraham was talking to God and God was going to go destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham said, what if there's 50? God says, I'll spare it for 50. What if there's 40? I'll spare it for 40. What if there's 30? I'll spare the city for 30. In our case, there were two. And I said, I don't want to quit. Uh, we don't know them folks, and they showed up. <laughs> so I don't want to quit. And so we just kept going, and we started having Sunday morning services, and we end up we're around 60 people now. Sometimes we've had close to 100 people in our little building for different things like that. One time I baptized 14 people in two months. <laughs> this is how the Lord has moved. But at the time in 2010 when I was ready to quit and I thought all the doors were shut, there was a church who took these beautiful pews and the furniture that we have and stuck them in storage. They paid $375 a month, adding up to about $20,000 and just gave them to us. So when I thought it was done, the Lord was making preparation. When you think it's done, the Lord's already at work. If the Lord has given you the vision and put you in it and has got you going in a certain direction and He wants you to do something and you might think, oh, that door's shut, that door's shut. It doesn't look like I can go over here. If the Lord's in it, He'll bring it to come to pass and you will have Whatever it is the Lord has provided for you, don't quit. Fella told wise, wise man told me a long time ago. He says, "You know why people fail? It ain't because they don't have money. It ain't because they don't love each other, like say in a marriage. It ain't because there's mysterious forces plotting against them. It's because they quit. That's why you fail because you quit." The Lord has given you a ministry. The only way you will fail is if you quit. Now, you may not understand what in the world the Lord is doing. Because here's Jonah. He's like, I don't like them stinking Ninevites. Them people are mean. And they were mean. They, they, these are evil people. They're doing all kinds of evil things. They used to get a team of horses over here, a team of horses over here, strap a guy in the middle of them, and then they take bets to see how long it takes to tear the guy into two. 
They had all kinds of fun doing this kind of stuff. Bury you up to your head in the sand and ride horses through you just to see, just to see the blood. I mean, just, just mean, cruel stuff. And God wanted them to stop doing this mean, cruel stuff. And then and Jonah, he didn't like them. Probably somebody that he knew and loved had been victimized by these people. He didn't like them. He goes, I'd, I'd rather go to the other side of the planet and have God strike me dead or drown me in a storm or something rather than go tell those people how they can be saved and how they can have this, this, this horrible fate that's coming upon them be avoided. So here's Nineveh. He got in a boat and said, I'm going that way. <laughs> I want nothing to do with them. When the storm comes up, he's sleeping in the bottom of the boat. He doesn't care if the boat sink. He wants to die. That wasn't nothing to do with it. When the people say, what in the world's going on here, Jonah? He says, if you chuck me overboard, all this storm will stop. He didn't care. He wanted to die. He would rather die than have these people repent. But Jonah found out there's fates worse than death. There's things that can happen to you that's worse than dying. There are things that when, that, that, that when the Lord is on you and He wants you to do something, having the Lord plague you to death is worse. Than, you might as well just go ahead and do what He wants. <laughs> when I first got into the ministry, I had this little old lady. She had blue hair. Cutest little thing. And she'd always come up to me and she had her finger was all messed up because she's old. She had like arthritis or something. And she'd point that finger at me and she goes, You're going to be a preacher. I said, what did I ever do to you? <laughs> I don't, I'm going gonna, gonna to make everybody mad being a preacher. She, you're going to do it. I've got three preachers in my family, and you're going to be a preacher. I mean, I ain't never done nothing to you. Come on. <laughs> you know, the Lord listens to the prayers of those little blue-haired ladies. I'm telling you. He listens to the prayers of them. The Lord listens to prayers. And what we have here in Jonah, wanting to go the other direction... But God knew that he had, to ha he, had been, he had been prepping and he had this whole thing together. You see the king there? <clears throat> the king comes down and he sets his royal apparel off to the side and he puts on sackcloth and ashes. That's just something you don't do when you're the king. That's like a national insult. Everybody, I mean, because in those days they believed the king was descended from the gods. They believed he was actually the son of God. For him to come down and take off his royal apparel and put on sackcloth and ashes, everybody knew, man, there's something going on. There's something bad happening here. And so we see, as this king repents like this, that God had been working in his life. He'd been preparing the king. You don't just walk into the king and say, Turn and burn, sinner! <laughs> it's not going to work. He's not going to listen. He's going to have one of his guards take a javelin and smote you to the wall. He's not going to take that kind of disrespect. But God had already been working in a man's life. God had already prepared it. God had been preparing this king because he'd been working on this king and he knew what you're doing's wrong, the way you're treating people's wrong, the way you're running around here doing all these different things is wrong. And he said, I'm going to send my servant in there. And the servant says, heck with that, I'm going the other way. Can you imagine how frustrating it is to be God? You go through all this work, line up all this stuff, get all these people on the same page, and your man runs the other direction. <laughs> What's wrong with people? Have you ever done that? It would seem like everything just goes wrong. You finally get this thing going this way and this thing going this way, and then all of a sudden it all just goes the wrong way. You, know, you can just imagine how frustrated you get. You say, man, I can't get a break. When my daughter had cancer, my mom about went and, well, she had to have a serious heart operation. I couldn't sell the one home that I had. It was dragging us down financially. I lost a customer. I said, God, don't you have someone else to pick on? <laughs> Everything's just going the wrong way. But in all of it, God is making provision. Just like he prepared the fish. Just like he prepared the king. If God has something for you, He's been making provision. If God's poking at you, if whenever we have the invitation and you feel that tugging down inside, you feel the Holy Spirit working on you and digging up and pulling things up, it's because He's got something for you. He's doing something in your life and He doesn't want you to quit. He's been making preparations. God told Jonah, go. Jonah didn't want to go. But we see when the king heard and he aside his royal apparel 
He tells everybody else, we got problems. We need to repent. And because of who the king was, because of his stature, because of the belief that they had about the king, because they knew who he was, everybody else said, if the king says it, something bad's going on here. We better repent. And so they all followed suit. They all repented and followed suit because of who the king was. Now Jonah could have walked through that town and he could have preached to everybody and their brother and the king could have been running around his royal apparel saying, don't listen to that nut, look at him, he's all screwed up. He's done been ate half by, way by a fish. He's just some kind of screwball. And everybody would have said, I'm not going to listen to this nut over here who's all screwed up. And he's went, you know, they didn't have a Walmart in between the, the ocean and Nineveh. He probably still wearing the same clothes. You know, all, half his eyebrows missing, you know, his hair's all chewed up, got that mess all over him. Probably stinks like a bad fish. And he's walking around in there telling everybody to repent. Nobody's going to listen to him. But because of who the king was, they knew something was going on. I know Brother Benny gets this. I get it all the time. Folks will come to me and they'll say, I want you to go visit Joe Flynn. Stepped on a bullfrog, fell down, hit his head. He's going to have brain surgery. I don't know who Joe Flynn is. I have no connection with the guy. But God has laid Joe Flynn on that guy's heart. So I'm going to the hospital. I got my wife with me. She's going through the 20 questions. Uh, who's, who's this Joe Flynn fellow? I don't know. Why are we going to visit him? Stepped on a bullfrog. Well, does he know we're coming? I don't know. <laughs> what are we going to do when we get there? I don't know. I don't know anything. I don't know the guy. But I'm visiting him because somebody asked me to go visit him. If God has laid someone on your heart and has given you that message, it's because you're the one that needs to go see him. Evangelism is not just the pastor's job. It's every single one of us. We are the priesthood of believers. And if you don't believe me and you don't understand what I'm talking about, you ask yourself, when one of your people that you work with, someone who don't go to church, who has nothing to do with God or anything else, is running around and, and they, they get cancer or something like that, who do they turn to and say, I want you to go to church and pray for me? They come to you, right? Because whether you like it or not, you're part of the priesthood of believers. They know who you are. You ever want wandering around and people start cussing and they quit cussing in front of you? <laughs> Why? You know, it's not like I got some special in with God. Hey, he cussed. <laughs> like I'm going to go tell God. People try and hide stuff from me all the time. They try and hide stuff from you. Facebook tells on you, though. <laughs> I just people running around, they got beers in their hand and stuff, you know, and then they come to church the next morning, they're like, what? <laughs> you know. So, you know, uh, you, you can find all kinds of stuff like that. But what I'm telling you is, though, is that God has you in the place you're in, and God has you in a circle of people, and He will use you just like He wanted to use Jonah. Don't be like Jonah and run the other direction. Now here's what Jonah wanted. I hate them stinking Ninevites. I want them all to be burned up. He wanted to watch them running around with their hair on fire and catching other buildings on fire. He hated all of them. And he wanted them to stop doing evil, but the way he wanted them to stop doing evil was that they all get burned up. Now here's the problem with that kind of thinking. It's the same problem we have with the Muslims who are running around blowing folks up. You can't convert dead people. It is not our job to kill people. Christ has sent us out into the world to win people to the Lord. It is our job to send out the light, send out the gospel light. My little granddaughter, that's her favorite song, Send the Light. She runs around singing that song. She got me singing it. She got my wife singing it. Everybody's yelling, Send the Light. You know, what are we supposed to do? Send the light to the lost and dying world. It's the only hope they have, brothers and sisters, because everywhere you look that mankind sits around calling this God and that's God and that thing over there is God, they're all telling them, Go out and do, 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 do. But our God says, Come, 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 come. My God loves. It is a show that he is the creator God. Because he doesn't order me to die for him. And he doesn't order me to kill no one else for him. He tells me, go out and share the gospel and love. Just like Jonah. Jonah had the wrong attitude. But what he does is he says, here's the mission field and I'm sending you to do it. You move heaven and earth and do whatever you got to do. But see to it that folks get saved. See to it that they hear the gospel. 
And it's, a, it's something for every single one of us. And you cannot convert dead people. There's been even Christian churches, Christian denominations that have run across this planet saying, repent, and they baptize them and then cut, kill them. That doesn't work. That isn't what God called us to do. We are to reach a lost and dying world. And because God is not willing that any should perish. That's the part Jonah missed. Jonah was willing all the Ninevites perish, but God wasn't willing any of those Ninevites perish. God isn't willing anybody in Corbin, Kentucky perish, perishes. He's not willing that anybody in El Dorado, Ohio perishes. He is willing that we go through and move everything in our power to go out and, and share the gospel with them. And if we go out and buy a hot dog, it should be within the idea that when we give them this hot dog, they're going to hear the gospel. We go out and set up a carnival and something like that. And we have a bunch of people come in and we say, wonderful, this is great. I was at a preaching conference one time and they said, we have block parties all the time. I said, well, how do you get the gospel to folks? You hand out flyers? You have people going out individually and talking to people? No, we don't share the gospel. It'll, it'll drive people away. What's the point if you're not going to share the gospel? When you share the gospel, there will always be those people who say, I don't want to hear it. And they'll walk away. We can't do anything about those folks. It's the ones that turn and say, that's what I needed to hear. Those are the ones we can do something about. It may not be the person you thought was going to listen. It may not be the person you like. It may not, it, they may smell funny. They might be ugly. They might be a, a hard to be around. There's some people that's hard to love. We look at Jonah. He said, I don't like them stinking Ninevites. I don't want any of them saved. But God wanted them saved, and that's who he sent them to. He don't care what you look like. He don't care what color your skin is. He don't care what your background is or who you're related to. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to eternal life. Isn't that great? That is evidence that he's the creator God. Because the other gods are very intolerant. Those people don't do what we want them to, they got to die. Those people don't do, we don't like them, they got to die. Them people ain't even the same color we are, they got to die. That's not what my creator God did. He loves them all. Loves them all and sends us to all of them. So we see here the king comes down and he repents and because of who he is, it, it affects everybody. But Jonah's not happy about it. Jonah goes up. <laughs> he goes up, he gets mad. He sets up on top of a hill and he's just waiting for a good scorching for him. He's waiting for a good scorching for him. He wants them all to perish. It ain't coming. It's kind of hot. I don't know, you know, this area where it's at, it's right across the river from Mosul in Iraq. That's where all our boys having all the trouble getting shot and IEDs and all that stuff. So it's 110 degrees in the shade. It's just, I don't know why people want to live three inches from the sun. I, it doesn't make any sense to me. But anyway, they, they live in this burning hot desert, and, and he's hot, he's burning up. And God causes this gourd to grow up over him, and it shades him, and, and he's wonderful, and he's happy. He's, he loves the gourd. Very happy for the gourd. But then a worm comes, eats the gourd, and it dies. Now he's sad. He's sad for the gourd. <laughs> Jonah's the first environmentalist wacko. You know, he's all been out of shape about a plant. There's a whole city of a million people here. <laughs> he wants them to burn. You know what I'm saying? He don't care about the people. He worried about the plant. And God comes to him and God says, look, you're upset about a plant. You didn't cause it to grow. You don't have no labor in that plant. You didn't plant the seed. You didn't water it. You didn't make sure no weeds grow up around it. This, weed, this plant has nothing to do with you. But next to you is a city that you went through the belly of a fish for. A city that you preached and overcame your fear to go talk to the king about what was going on. You could have been killed. You go to this place and, and there's a million people repenting and they're not getting the judgment of God because of your work. When I told you God is not willing that any should perish, He's not willing that your uncle, your nephew, your aunt, your friend, your children, He doesn't want them to perish and He'll use you to reach them. And you say, i got to go to work. I don't have time. My car needs a fuel pump. I can't do that. 
Well, man, I'd like to go there today, but you know, Brother Jim's coming over, and we got to go. We're going to go try. We're going to go try the new Kentucky Fried Chicken, or the, the old Kentucky Fried Chicken. I'm looking forward to that. Original Kentucky. By the way, a little bit on that side. Y'all call Kentucky Fried Chicken down here just fried chicken? Or you call it Kentucky Fried Chicken? You know? Because I'm thinking if you're in Kentucky, it's just kind of silly to call it Kentucky Fried Chicken. If it's made here, it's Kentucky Fried Chicken. You just call it fried chicken. <laughs> but anyway, that's a little off the thing there. These people... <laughs> She's clearing her throat. When she clears her throat, i got to move on. <laughs> people bring her water and everything else. You know, just, nah, she don't need water. She's just telling me I've been on this point for too long. <laughs> or, or if I get a little close, you know, a little sensitive area. She, <clears throat> okay. <laughs> Shouldn't have said that about women. <laughs> You know, something, you know, there's always some reason. She keeps me out of trouble. So now you got me off track. So anyway, God's using you to go to them so that they would not perish. Don't be a Jonah and have to go through the belly of a whale because it ain't no fun being in the belly of the fish. It ain't no fun being despondent, downtrodden, discouraged. Because I have found that every time God has put me on a direction and put me on a path and said, this is what I want you to do, and I said, I don't much care for that direction. I don't much care for that path. That doesn't make any sense to me. You know, my son, he drives me nuts. I love him to death. But every time I tell him to do something, I have to explain why everything. Just, it's my stuff. Do it that way. You know, and you have to just think God kind of gets tired of that stuff too. Every time God gives us a mission, says, I want you to go over here, and you say, Why? It'd be better for me to go over here. And he says, Well, you just do what I said. <laughs> What's wrong with you? You know, got my children have taught me more about how God looks at me than anything else. Because it gets kind of frustrating sometimes. You just wonder, well, why do I gotta explain everything to you? Just do what I told you. Have a little bit of faith. And that's a lot of times what God's telling us. Have a little bit of faith. I know what I'm doing. I'm sending you there. Because I know what I'm doing. One of the smartest people I ever met. He was my mentor. He taught me how to do make the false teeth. Helped me get started in business. Gave me pieces of equipment. Helped me get accounts set up and all kinds of stuff. And I got saved. I didn't, when I first met him, I didn't really know the Lord as my Savior. I hadn't been saved yet. And so I got saved, and I told him, you know, and I'm telling him all well, what's going on and how I got saved, I got baptized, and, and you know, we, he loves to talk about God, we're talking about God and everything else, but I was so intimidated by him. Smartest man I ever know. Had done so much stuff for me, and I wanted to share the gospel with him, but I was scared. I thought, he's going to think I'm a religious fanatic. He's going to think I done lost my mind. He's going to think, you know, he's going to judge me. He's going to think I, I, I'm just being silly. I mean, you know all of this stuff that comes along. Not only that, he was my boss. <laughs> you know, so it's hard to share with your boss. What if he gets mad and tells you not to come to work tomorrow? So I got 1,500 excuses of why I can't tell this man about the gospel. And we're sitting there working, grinding on teeth one day, and he goes, why ain't you ever told me how to be saved? That's uh, 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 he goes, am I not good enough to go to your church? I, no, 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 no. Don't you want me to be in heaven with you? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, why, why haven't you told me how to be saved? And, and so here I am trying to backtrack and trying to share the gospel with him. There is no reason for the child of God to be intimidated by the gospel. Because you do not share the gospel by yourself. You do not go out and share the gospel on a cold sales call. God is already working in their life. No matter who they are. No matter how important they are. No matter how much money they have. No matter how much you think they're so much smarter than you are. God has already been working in their life. And I'm going to tell you something about the human condition. Everyone wants to be loved and accepted by God. Whether they know it or not, they want to be loved and accepted by God. They'll go to a psychologist, and they'll pay a psychologist tens of thousands of dollars, and they'll be on 14 different drugs because they're looking for love and acceptance, especially from God, but from God's people also. That's one of the things that we love about our church. Everyone who comes in gets a hug, and everyone who comes in gets a sucker. No, they get a hug. <laughs> no suckers. I don't have those suckers. 
Well, you just have a mint or something. But just letting them know they came to the right place. This is home. This is family. You want to kick your shoes off? That's okay as long as you wash your feet before you do it. Let them know they're loved and accepted. Because Christ isn't standing next to them physically. He's standing with them spiritually. You've got to be the person that makes them feel at home. Just like they walked into your house. Can I get you something to drink? Can I get you a mint? Can I get you... Are you hungry? Do you need aspirin? <laughs> You're at home. You've come to the right place. You're welcome in God's house. Everyone wants to be loved and accepted by God. They can get picked on by the world. They can get picked on by their own family. You know all the troubles that happen between family. They get mad at each other, won't talk to each other for 20 years. Family will run you out. Friends will run you out. You get fired, but you want to be accepted by God. That's the secret. Make everyone feel like they're at home. Especially the lost. They can get cold, careless, and indifferent in the world everywhere they want to go. They can get judgmentalism. They can get, I'm better than you, anywhere they want to go in the world. But in God's house, they need to know that God, Christ died for their sins. The same blood that covers them is the same blood that covers me. We're all equal in that matter. It's the only place you find fairness is in front of God. You won't find it in the court. You won't find it in the government. But you'll find it in God. The only place fairness exists. And here's the thing. Jonah's and God's, their idea was the same. Nineveh should stop doing wicked things. Nineveh should stop oppressing everybody. Nineveh should stop sinning. Nineveh should turn to the Lord. Turn and repent. But Jonah wanted it done. They, he wanted all of this evil to stop through them getting burnt up. God chose to do it through a half-eaten preacher. God's will is going to be done. When I first got saved, somebody told me, Frank's sick. He's in the hospital. He needs uh, some prayer. Let's all get together and let's pray. Frank, we're going to pray for Frank. Invariably, somebody would always come up. Well, I'm not going to pray that Frank gets better. I'm going to pray that the Lord's will is done. The Lord's will is that the sun comes up tomorrow, he's going to come up tomorrow. His will is going to be done. His will was that Nineveh would stop doing this evil stuff. But it's the method through which he did it that the prayer counts. We find here that the king said, Who can tell? Who can tell if God will repent? Who can tell what God's going to do? You can't tell what God's going to do. That's the thing, you know, when you know you are on the wrong path, the king knew they were on the wrong path. He knew he needed to repent. If you're on the wrong path, you know it. Now, you can argue with it, and you can fight with it, and you can say, no, nah, I'm just indigestion, or I'm just tired, or, or, or what are the people at work going to think, or something. You can come up with every reason in the world why it's not whatever you, the Lord is putting them, but you know when it's God and he's working with you. It's God and he's wanting you to do something. You can come up with any excuse you want to. But when it's God, you know it deep down inside. You can fight it all you want to, but you know it deep down inside. The king knew it deep down inside. And that's what caused the repentance. And, and he turned from his old way. That's what repent means. Repent is not just being sorry, but it's turning like this. I'm not going to follow the world anymore. I'm going to follow God. I'm not going to follow after all of that anymore. I'm going to follow God. Listen, maybe you're here this morning... And God has been showing you, you've been going down the wrong path. Maybe it's that you're a Christian and God has been calling you and putting something on your heart. You need to go talk to so-and-so. You need to talk to your friend. You need to talk to this person over here. Don't be intimidated. That's why I shared that story with you. Hey, man, I got pride like anybody else. I don't want to come here and tell you a bunch of foolish stuff I ever did. But the Bible says through the foolishness of preaching is how God sends out His Word. I'll be a fool for it. Now, I won't, make, I won't embarrass you when we go to Kentucky Fried Chicken. I won't embarrass somebody. I won't stand to somebody and say, Get out of the way! <laughs> I'm not going to embarrass you out in public. But I'll embarrass myself in front of the Lord's people and in front of lost people if it will win someone to the Lord. 
I'll tell you anything you want to know. I'll tell you how I screwed up here. I'll tell you how I screwed up over there. I'll tell you how I fell flat on my face over there if it'll show you you're doing the same thing and you need to turn the other way before you find yourself in the belly of a fish. Because when God has something for you, He wants you to go that direction. Maybe He showed you you're going the wrong direction this morning. And you need to turn. Like the king did. Turn. It ain't because I pointed it out to you. It's because God's showing it to you. Maybe you're here this morning and you've never accepted Christ as your personal Savior. You know you've been on the wrong path. You've been following after what the world says. Following after all this other stuff. You know, running to excessive riot with the world, which is exactly what the Bible tells us not to do. I had a lady tell me one time, funniest thing. She said, I want you to just, I want you to hear this story. She said, God just blessed me the other night. It's 2 o'clock in the morning and they closed the bar up. And I locked my keys in the car. And God sent somebody to come over and get them keys out of the car for me. Ain't God good? Are you trying to tell me God, God helped you participate in breaking the law? Driving drunk? Well, I, it got me here on church on Sunday. <laughs> it's craziness. It's funny the things that people will tell you. If you're listening to people, they'll tell you all kinds of crazy stuff they believe about God. But the point is, even if you've been in church for a long time, even if you show up to church every Sunday, have you actually accepted Christ as your personal Savior? And if you have accepted Christ as your personal Savior, you can get saved like Brother... I appreciate what you said this morning. You can get saved like Brother Benny was talking about, but not be a righteous person. You can be backslidden, down discouraging, discouraging to other people. When folks, I remember when I first got saved, I had no idea what happened to me. I got saved, I didn't understand the gospel, I didn't know nothing. All I knew was drinking and running wild in the streets and doing drugs and everything else. I didn't know what to do. So I went right back out to drinking and doing drugs and everything else. Now I had accepted Christ as my personal Savior, but I didn't know what it was. So I went back to the party scene. I went back to the party friend. And I'm standing there with a beer in my hand. And I'm telling people, hey, listen, man, I had this experience with God. <laughs> and they say, you're drinking the same stuff I am. Maybe you had just a little bit too much. It don't work that way. Can't hold on to the world with one hand. Try and hold on to God with the other. Maybe you've been saved, but you've been a horrible testimony to other people. You can't win people to the Lord. With a beer can in your hand. And I have it all the time. Folks come to me and say, We was at the biker rally. Everybody was getting drunk. We was talking about how great El Dorado Baptist Church is. Well, we didn't see a soul on Sunday morning come from that. There's no fruit from that kind of behavior. There's no fruit being born. Because you cannot live that way. Maybe God has showed you, you maybe you're in the belly of the whale now. Maybe God has shown you, I have prepared a great fish for you. Maybe God's put you in the belly of the whale right now because he wants you to turn. I don't want you to be like Jonah. Jonah gets swallowed by a big old great fish. It's three days before he figures out. Now you would think that at the time you're being eaten, you would call out to God. But he's ready to die. Fish goes down under the water. If you get out of the fish at that point, you can't get to the surface before you drown. You're doomed. He says he's being corrupted, which means he's being digested. That has to hurt. Swallowing that stuff in your mouth makes your throat sore. You know what I'm saying? In pain, in misery, in torment. And, and in fact, when he turns to pray, he says, God, I prayed and you heard me out of the belly of hell. That's how bad it was. Don't be like Jonah. When you figure out you're in the belly of the whale, turn to God first. Turn to God immediately. It took three days for Jonah to wake up and call out to God. It took three days. Don't wait. When the music starts and we start having uh, the, the invitation and, and the Lord's working on your heart, don't sit there and wait for three days. The Bible says my spirit will not always strive with man. You can put God off long enough, he'll go move to somebody else to listen. Happened to me. I got saved and the Lord was calling me forward. I said, I don't know them folks. I don't want to go up in front of them. It'd be embarrassing. I don't know any of them. 
I don't want to sit up there and have the preacher talk to me. Because I don't know anybody here. Two, two services, three services, four services. On the fifth service, the Lord didn't call so hard. The Lord kind of went, if you ain't doing nothing else, you might want to head up. I didn't hear nothing else from him. I got to looking around. <laughs> I think I'm messing up here. Because he pulled like there was no tomorrow the first time. The second time he pulled and I was holding on to the back of the pew, man, you could see the imprints on the pew. Third time, I was a little lighter, and by the time it got to the fifth time, he just said, you know, if you want to. It's not that he was giving up on me. But you can quench the Spirit of God. Put him off. Put him off. Put him off. You know what? I got other Jonas. I got other Abrahams. It was Elijah who said, everybody hates me. Nobody loves the Lord but me. I'm all by myself. And God said, I got all kinds of people that have not bowed the knee to Baal, who was the false god. God's got other people. If you ain't going to do it, his will is going to be done. What you want to be is like Paul. We find in the book of Romans, the church just starts in Rome. Nobody knows who started it. Isn't that great? <laughs> it's already working. Paul the apostle didn't start it. He didn't know what was going on. He wrote to him, he says, I can't wait to get there so I can have some fruit amongst you. He found out where God was working and he got involved in it. These are spiritual principles that lead to a happy Christian life. Find out where God is working and get involved right in the middle of it. Do not wait. Do not put him off. Do not sit around and let somebody else get in there and get your blessings. You ever see them pinatas at little kids' birthday parties? They smack the pinata, the kid who stands back don't get no candy, does he? I'm not saying God's going to give you candy. I'm saying he's going to give you blessings you cannot count. He'll make you a rich person, maybe not in money. He'll make you rich in love. He'll make you rich in acceptance. He'll make you rich in the word of God and the kingdom of God. Get in there and get your blessings. Get in there and do what God has for you. If the Holy Spirit is pulling on you tonight, it's because he's got plans. I'm sorry, this morning. It all, it's dark. I don't know. <laughs> Y'all don't have no window. I can't see if the light's shining. <laughs> You understand what I'm saying? This is what Jonah's example was. You got a person who's been called to be a mission. You've been all called to be missionaries. Every last one of us as the priesthood of believers have been called out into a lost and dying world and you may be the only hope they ever have of seeing the truth. And your job is to change the eternal destiny of men and women and boys and girls. The answer is, will you be a Jonah and go the wrong direction? Or will you be an apostle, a disciple, someone who goes out and says, I'll do what it takes, Lord, just send me. Here am I, send me. I want to turn it over to Brother Benny. And we'll have, a, I guess, time invitation, is that what you do? And I'll just turn it over to him. If God has laid something on your heart, do not hesitate. Do as the Holy Spirit has been.